everybody, this is Perch, and uh, talking about something positive in comics, at least in my view anyway, and it, it's too early to state whether this will be fully positive or not. So, granted, I think a couple of you could push back on what I'm about to say by uh, using the simple argument, yeah, but they're going to screw it up. Yeah, you, you're, you're probably right. I, I, who knows? You know, the funny thing about comics is you can almost always bet on both outcomes, and I understand that's become almost a meme-like joke to a lot of my videos, but comics has uh, highs and lows, and it seems to constantly waffle between those highs and lows. And so the only thing that you can completely count on is that if things are going well, they're bound to mess it up, and and uh, vice versa. So uh, that is uh, that's definitely that's definitely true. So here's something though that I think is going relatively well. Um, I, I right now, and I'll, to give you some background on all this because it kind of leads to a bunch of things that were done wrong. Um, one of the things that I've been frustrated about is the lack of what I would call you know really investing in villains or characters that are going to be antagonists for our heroes. Uh, they you know the companies don't do that well. Um, they have treated villains increasingly like a joke, or they want to give villains a sympathetic backstory that, you know, is, uh, causes us to look at them in a new way. And, and, you know, but, but unfortunately in doing so, they take the teeth out of that villain. The other thing is it makes the villains very, very shallow. And that's the, the biggest piece of it in giving them a kind of a sympathetic backstory. It also tends to be the same backstory. All the villain is, you know, you think they're villainous, but they're not really that villainous because they were, you know, abused as a child, and then this is why they turned out. They just, just, it's kind of a, like there's two to three origin stories that gets passed around, um, and so that's that's the problem. So Ben Riley has been, uh, you know, a, an interesting character since he was introduced as part of the Clone Saga and kind of this replacement for Peter Parker. And then that the whole Clone Saga itself is a weird one because that, that entire uh, period of comics was reviled uh, by a lot of people, by I would say the majority of people for a time as being one of the, one of the embarrassing parts of the 90s. It sold pretty well when it first came out. And there was some excitement around it. But then as time went by, it's like people became embarrassed of it. And, and it was one of the things often cited as the excess of the 90s or something that went, you know, just just wrong in the 90s. And, uh, and, and so then this weird nostalgia started to kick in where people were like, man, I love the Clone Saga. And it's, it, it, so it's, it's gone through multiple iterations of whether people love it or hate it. And now it tends to be not on a love exactly stage, but on a nostalgia stage. People who are who miss the '90s are like, ah, oh, that Clone Saga was not that bad. I mean, I, I like that Clone Saga. So Ben Riley, um, when he reemerged as what the Clone Conspiracy was, when he just reemerged, and then they briefly had a, I believe, a Peter David series where he was in Vegas trying to kind of be a hero again after he was kind of a villain in the Clone Conspiracy thing that Dan Slott uh, put out, and then the character kind of more or less, um, I would say vanished from sight, but it, it seemed like they were dying it down a little bit, and uh, when Nick Spencer left Spider-Man somewhat abruptly to go off and do Substack, which is, uh, by the way, is a, a whole other video topic, Substack is like colder than ice at the moment, like even a lot of the creators that were over there are very excited about it. there's there's no energy and momentum and excitement coming out of Substack at all, and that's uh, that's potentially a bigger problem that somebody should really get on. <laughs> oh, probably somebody from Substack. I mean, they they put this money in, but you do start to wonder like, at what point does uh, you know like, I, at what point are we going to get a bidding war for James Tinney and services uh, from either Marvel or DC? I, I you just you just do wonder. Uh, because it feels inevitable at that point that this is uh, this is coming. But anyway, uh, but Spencer leaves kind of abruptly, and then um, we get this uh, the Beyond era, and I was pretty critical of it. It was uh, multiple writers all doing Spider-Man. Not, what I was critical about was a multiple writer kind of uh, you know joint committee approach, and I was critical of it because of history because. The, uh, the first time they did this with Spider-Man, I wasn't a fond of, uh, fond of that era. I didn't think it was very good. I was much, even very unfond of the X-Men committee era that we had while they were waiting for Hickman to take over. Um, so when this one came around, it just, it didn't, I, I was not excited about it. I, I thought, nah. 
And then some of the early material, like we're going to, you know, bring in the Beyond Corporation. They're from Next Wave. Who doesn't love Next Wave? And so it, it felt like, um, I don't know, I, I had very, very low expectations for what we were going to get out of it. And when the comic first started, um, my expectations, I think, were pretty, pretty realized. I, I, it wasn't, they weren't terrible comics, but, you know, I didn't think they were particularly exciting. It was, um, I don't know, it, it, they were, they were, they're fine. Um, but I think Spencer was working above expectations in the book. He was doing some interesting things and they did like, okay, we're going to put Peter Parker on the shelf. And there was a weird timing that it came out at the same time as Spider-Man three. And that was kind of weird that they would do that, but whatever the end result of all this. And here's where we've got spoilers. So at this point I haven't spoiled anything, but you know, spoils spoilers. If you've not read the current issue of Spider-Man before they relaunch it again. Uh, but basically uh, during the course of that event, they did a pretty good job, and it was visual, um, was why it was, so I think it was Patrick Gleason, although I may be uh, incorrect about that, who started to really kind of lean into this idea that when, like, Ben Riley would look at himself in the mirror, they would, they would show Ben Riley's face as this kind of just dark, void hole, and it was a way of kind of indicating that, you know, his memories were degrading, that he could remember some stuff and not other stuff, and it was... But he knew that the, it was like amnesia, but he knew that the amnesia was there. So it wasn't just he forgot. He forgot, but knew that he had forgotten. And so it was an interesting dynamic. We just got to see the character kind of fray out. And so, you know, in the last couple issues, it's gotten it got more and more desperate to the point where uh, Ben Riley was, you know, he was not acting like a hero anymore. He was trying to survive. He wanted his own identity. And the comic book and the writing, to the credit of the people involved, snapped into a pretty interesting gathering of all the different threads that have been Ben Riley's life, where he, he, you know, basically he had a mean, he was, he was a clone, so he was just copy, and his memories were a copy, but now he didn't even have that, and, and kind of, he, he was aware he's lost something, but he doesn't know what he lost, and it, it just created this, um, you know, paranoia, this, this, uh, you know, you know, this strange rage-like aspect to the character that is actually compelling that you can do some things with. And in the in the very end, you know, he basically dips into some Joker goo or, or some 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 such thing, and it appears that he's dead, but he hasn't died. And he reemerges from the goo, and he has uh, he's basically got this new weird uh, venom-like costume. It's not a symbiote, but it looks like it's controllable it's it's uh it responds to his thoughts or something but he's still seeing kind of that he has no face when he looks at his reflection so there's an interesting kind of almost horror like aspect to what's become of ben riley uh but without you know you just he's he's edgy he's he's still probably thinks of himself slightly as a hero but at this point he's you know very very bitter very angry toward peter parker so it, it sets up a nice logical villain um, or at least antagonist type character for, for Spider-Man. He's got a Spider-Man like costume, except it's black and it's got some greens and blues in there and just looks, you know, looks different and everything else. And it, it, it's what, you know, I've been hoping for, or what I've been asking for Marvel to do, which is invest some time into your villain and actually give them complexity without going to the same old, same old, uh, backstory and everything else and make them threatening, make them sinister, make it feel like this is somebody who's actually going to give the hero a run for their money. And so we got somehow out of all this, you know, this clone saga, which was loved and then hated and sort of loved again. And there's just some nostalgia around it. And then, you know, this, uh, last second kind of Spencer leaves and we have to do something with, uh, with old Ben Riley and it, but, but who is he beyond just like wearing a Spider-Man suit that's slightly different from the original Spider-Man suit. And it's just like, I don't, so they took all these different threads and they actually assembled them in such a way that I think we, I, I think it's money. I think it's actually something that they can turn around and, and do good things with. You can see if now, and here comes the big question mark. If they do it right, they have set themselves up. They've, they've teed up a great sinister uh, evil Spider-Man character, somebody who knows a lot of Peter Parker's secrets but doesn't know them all, so the writers have some things they can play with now or they they can uh, make him a threat, but they can also dodge questions like, why doesn't he do murder Aunt May? Well, maybe he doesn't know Aunt May exists anymore. So there's just a bunch of different aspects here. 
and it's uh, it's well done. It was it was a good outcome. I, I thought, you know, a lot of the story beats, a lot of the ways of how we got here were clunky, and I don't think that was always done in the best way. But, you know, the conclusion, the sum, is what you want your your comic companies, particularly the big ones, Marvel and DC, where they have all this legacy and all this history and all these characters, and they you know they they need to do something with it. They need to actually be able to to have some kind of good outcome happen, uh, they, they teed themselves up to be stronger at the end than they were at the beginning. And that's, I think, the, the biggest point I want to make here, is that in a lot of cases, and a lot of comics that are coming out right now, um, they, they start stronger than they end. That's definitely the story for many of Marvel and DC's events, where you know, by the time you know, they get a good concept, it's like, oh, there's uh, the king and uh, Null, the king in black, and he's a, got a you know, very sinister, super big threat. It's going to be really incredible. But by the time the event all wraps up and it's over, um, the, the, the villain, they're like, there's no Null. Null was defeated and killed and he's gone. And there's not a, you know, they're not going to be able to continue to do things with Null unless they somehow resurrect him some, in a kind of a weird, clunky way. So there's just, it, it is... The comic companies right now are very good at ending weaker than they began. And in this instance, they actually took a bunch of parts that were very confusing, very convoluted, very um, very messy in terms of all this Clone Saga stuff. And they have, at the end, managed to pull out a, uh, a stronger end than the start. And they've given themselves, again, if they do it right, They've given themselves some pretty massive new IP that they'll be able to do something with in the comics. It's going to be harder to translate that one into the, uh, into the, you know, the, the movies. But, you know, there's, there is a chance here that they get something really nice out of it. And, and uh, they, they, you know, <laughs> it's a cause for celebration at this point for the big two. I don't know about for me, but for the big two, it's a cause for celebration when you have a character that could be the next, uh, you know, Venom if they play their cards right. So... Anyway, there you go. <laughs> so I think they did well. So my hats off to Marvel. You know, they, they did a good job there. A bunch of the writers are not always my favorite writers, but they, they did something clever. And uh, that's worth saying. So some positivity. Now, I'll let all of you kick into the negativity in the comments below. And thanks for listening.